Hello, and welcome to Mental Health Mondays. We are so excited that you are here with us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As always, we like to know where you are viewing and watching from. Before we actually went live, I saw that somebody is uh, watching from uh, Jamaica. So welcome uh, from Jamaica. And we want to know where everyone is watching from. So please put it in the chat. Okay, Antioch, Tennessee. Again, not that far, I think, from where I am right now. Welcome. And welcome, Dr. White. We both welcome everyone. All right. And I think Dr. White is muted, so unmute yourself. Yeah, please put in the chat where you're watching from. All right, mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas. Welcome. All right, you're here. Okay, you're live. Bay Bayside. California. Matthew, welcome. Love so, that. so happy to um, have everyone on uh, this evening. You know, we took a week off. Toronto, Canada. Welcome. Palm Beach, Florida. All right. So okay. we are so happy to have you uh, here with us this evening. Carson, California. That's right down the road for me. Yeah. Not, no, nope, that's, yes. Madison, Alabama. Welcome. That's definitely not far for me. <laughs> Pennsylvania, another one. Welcome, Gigi from Texas. We are so happy to have you here with us. Before I forget, what I would like for you to do, if you are blessed by the Mental Health Mondays, if you enjoy the program, you've, you've watched some, please share it on your social media. Um, so to let everyone know that uh, this is happening right now, that we're live and we're talking about depression. So if you like, can you like it and share it? So if you're watching on uh, YouTube or FaceTime, I'm, I'm sorry, not FaceTime, but Facebook, if you're watching through any one of those, you can like the program and then share it. And that will help us get the word out. So Dr. White, it's good to see you. Uh, we were gone uh, for a week, so we haven't been on live for two weeks. Uh, but the last program we did on depression uh, was really uh, amazing. It was so many, there were so many questions and there were so many comments that we're doing um, another one today and we'll see how today goes and we see how long this is going to go, but we're going to continue to talk about depression. Absolutely. Uh, Tante, I'm super excited today to um, basically prime the questions by discussing uh, Dr. Neil Nedley's 10 hits. Um, so Dr. Neil Nedley has a depression recovery program and he's gone through the trouble of really um, looking at his uh, cohort of patients and from a statistical standpoint, identifying some of the hits, as he calls them, uh, mm -hmm. that increase the likelihood that a person will experience uh, depression. And so we're going to review those 10 hits because the, the exciting thing is Imagine if there's a hit that you can actually do something about. Right. So, uh, yeah. That would be a fantastic opportunity to then intervene. Uh, because yes. the healthcare I'm excited about is the one in which we activate ourselves to move towards health. You right. don't have to experience your health passively. You, mm -hmm. can, you can be an active participant in promoting health in your in your well-being experience and so we love the notion of equipping you with information that right. you in partnership with your healthcare team can implement to embrace the healing that you've been designed for right what i um and we're going to go over those 10 hits uh this evening but what i like about um what dr uh, nedley's program has shown is that um it takes four of the 10 hits to cause depression but let's just say you have three out of the 10 hits then, and it could be that you, it just shows that our mind is so resilient um, and that you might have three of those hits, but if you have four or over, then that takes you into full depression. So um, I found that quite interesting um, yeah. that his, yeah. We're that his fearfully, fearfully made. Fearfully, yes. Fearfully yes. Made. And some of those, and three of those hits, um, could be some big hits, but if they, they're, you know, but the brain is able to, um, to be able, it's resilient, like I said. And so um, it, 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 over four, it takes us into depression. So even with three, and those could be three major ones, doesn't mean 
that you'll necessarily be depressed. So we want to jump into what these hits are. But before we jump in, I'd like to ask if you'd say a word of prayer. Absolutely. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for this opportunity for us to discuss these issues. We pray that the information would be empowering to those that hear it. And, um, you know, thank you for creating this space in, in which we're able to do this. So please clarify our thoughts um, and, uh, and be with everyone uh, in the struggles that they're having. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to let everyone know that we are taking your questions. So please put them in the chat as we are discussing some of these hits. So we definitely are taking your questions and want to hear from you. Um, Dr. White, your microphone is sounding a little poppy. We did work on that before we went on live, but it seems to be back. And I don't know if it's um, going to be a distraction or anything like that. I don't want it to be to anybody, but uh, I don't know if you could go in and come back um, before we start to go over these these hits. Um, not a problem. Okay, let's see if that helps, if that works. Um, again, you can put your questions in the chat. We're talking about depression. Uh, we want to, to get to, to some of your questions. Um, I don't know, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Nedley's um, depression recovery program. Um, it, he has done it... Um, around the world, but it has been um, very, 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 it's very, very good. Um, and it has helped many, many people. And so we want to talk about those 10 hits that he uh, talks about uh, today. And again, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, ah, I see some questions coming, coming in as we're waiting for Dr. White. Um, what about manic uh, depression? Um, and I'm not sure if you're, because when, it, when, we, when we're talking about um, manic depression or manic um, um, stage, we're talking about bipolar. So there needs to be a manic phase and a depressive episode stage. stage. And that manic, um, so I'm not sure if you're talking about bipolar, you might want to clarify a little bit more, but in that manic uh, phase, there's uh, like a, at least at least needs to last for seven days. And there's no, there's a, a, a lack of need of sleep during those seven days. And so um, and then it also needs to after that manic seven day um, cycle, there also has to be um, a, de a major depressive episode after that as well. So if that's exactly what you're talking about, uh, manic depression, if you're talking about that goes with uh, bipolar. Um, and so um, that's not exactly what we're talking about um, this, this evening, but bipolar does have a major depressive episode component along with it. Um, and so, so yeah, let's see. Okay, we have some questions here. I see a question that says, are one of these, uh, hits being depressed and still acting happy. Um, that's not necessarily one of the hits, but um, we do call that high functioning depression. And that is very real. Um, and there are people that have different levels of depression are able to cope in society and do the normal day to day things. Um, so you can be depressed and still be going to work, still be going to school uh, and doing all of those, all of those things, but is not considered a hit. And just waiting for Dr. White to, to be able to come back in, but I'll be taking some more of your questions. Uh, let's see. All right, wondering if it is uh, possible of organizing a mental health resource list to help people on a personal level. Yes, that's definitely something we wanna do. There's some really good resources out there. There's amazing books. Um, uh, that we are planning to offer. I think the last time we were on, we said we were going to make up a list. So that's definitely something that we plan uh, to do. Um, and so, all right. I think we have Dr. White coming back on here. Uh, let's see here. All right, there we are. We are okay. now, we are back. Okay. And it, I don't think I hear the popping, but I'll let you talk to see it. Two, three, testing. Are we good? Yes, that actually does sound much, much better. That's great. Awesome. Um, I just took a few questions while you were gone. Um, 
and they were all on depression. But someone did remind me because we did talk about, and this is something that I'm going to make a note that we don't forget. We were going to make a, a resource list or books that we can offer for people to read on these different topics. And so we will definitely bring that next week to Mental Health Monday. Um, so thanks for uh, reminding me that we already said that we were going to do that, but we're definitely going to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, let's jump in to the, to the 10 hits. We'll see if we get through all of them. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. I know. Okay. For the first one um, that is, is listed is um, a genetic hit. And so maybe you want to explain that a little bit more, what a genetic hit looks like. Yeah, no, no problem. So, you know, as, so the current theory about the depression is the deficiency of a, a prominent neurotransmitter called serotonin. And mm -hmm. so the idea is if serotonin is deficient in certain parts of the brain, then you'll have depression. And mm -hmm. I say that theory because of course, there's ongoing work that is showing that depression is something very comprehensive and that might be much more beyond just a uh, neurotransmitter deficiency that will explain uh, deficiency. There was, a, there was a time where when you heard about heart disease, um, it was thought to be just one specific thing. And then the research has now shown that it's like a syndrome and there are many different forms of heart disease, so to speak. And I think it's going to be something similar to that mm -hmm. with depression, where we're going to find that actually depression is this, you know, conglomerate of different syndromes. And so we can eventually be able to tease it out. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is, um, let's go with that theory of serotonin deficiency. So um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's produced in the neurons. And um, so it actually will, you know, it'll go into the vesicles in the end of the neuron and the neurons um, will release the vesicles that, which will re release the, um, the serotonin and it interacts with receptors on the other neuron. Mm -hmm. So let's get a visual of what I'm talking about. So let's say this is uh, neuron number one, which we used to call the presynaptic neuron. And this is neuron number two. And this is a postsynaptic neuron. It's almost better if they're shaking hands. Mm -hmm. Presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron. But what you would see is there's this space and it's called the synaptic cleft. And so this neuron is like releasing the neurotransmitters and though that um, the serotonin is going to go and interact with receptors on this, um, on this other neuron. Presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron. And they have different terminologies for it. Mm -hmm. um, now, but the bottom line being um, serotonin interacting with those receptors is what's going to cause the signal of its presence to then be transmitted and affect certain um, things. Mm -hmm. Well, all along that continuum, if you have, let's say, like genetic problems that are perhaps not producing enough uh, serotonin or um, there, there's not... Um, in, in, enough serotonin being produced, or if for some reason, maybe the receptor can't actually, you know, receive that serotonin, the signal isn't being sent. What you see is along that chain, there are many genetic contributions that could cause the serotonin uh, to affect to not be as effective. Mm -hmm. What you see practically and clinically is in some families, um, you'll, you'll see that there is a strong occurrence of depression. And so mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons why we'll even ask clinically, hey, do you have a family history of um, depression? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then sometimes as far, and that can be an important thing to become aware of because the other issue is sometimes you can see a familial um, predisposition to responding to a certain um, medication. And so that, that's another reason why it's important to, uh, to ask that question. But the idea mm -hmm. just being, there's definitely a genetic contribution to the discussion of depression. So with that said, and explained very well, um, would somebody be led to think that because there is a genetic disposition to being depressed, that they're, that they're doomed to have to be depressed because there's a genetic disposition to that? Well, there's a field called epigenetics that is talking about the fact that, um, that the environment can play a role in whether uh, genes will be expressed. Right. And 
So um, that's one thing that would enter into the discussion to say, hey, is there a guarantee that because there's a genetic predisposition, it's actually going to be um, uh, expressed? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, as we talk about the 10 hits, you're going to find out that, hey, there are some environmental issues that can sort of counter that um, predisposition. Mm -hmm. um, and as we mentioned before, genetics is just one hit. And right. so typically the body um, will need like several hits in right. order for the person actually succumb to depression. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's going back to your point about resilience. And yeah. this is according to the work of, of Dr. Nedley. Right. And according no. to his work, there needs to be four hits. Um, I said, according to his uh, studies, there has to be four hits. And right. they really, um, as I was reading and listening to some of his work, um, they work to like deal with, I mean, they're not necessarily trying to deal with all 10 hits. They're trying to come get you down to that level where um, you still might have some of these hits, but you don't have over four and that you're functioning and a pretty much uh, non-depressive state, but you still may be dealing with three of those hits. Um, right. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty amazing um, how they go through that. There's some, right. go ahead. So to my knowledge, there are no tests that are gonna check for serotonin levels at this point, um, to my understanding. And I don't believe there are tests for melatonin uh, deficiencies either. Um, uh, yeah. Right, right, there's just symptoms. Um, that let you know. I was going to say, because this might be a question out there, somebody may be, um, just be wondering about, because the antidepressants are um, synthetic serotonin, right? And so... No. no well, so, go ahead. Yeah, antidepressants, I mean, I guess the more popular ones that you hear of are the selective serotonin reuptake okay. inhibitors. And yeah. so what they're doing is basically... As I mentioned before, you get these neurons that are releasing serotonin. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the cycle um, to get rid of the serotonin that's been released is there are channels um, and there are transporters that will reuptake that serotonin. So mm -hmm. the way some of these uh, antidepressants work, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, is they block that transporter so that it's not taken back up. Right. So that the net effect is there's increased activity of that serotonin. So it's sort of like kids, you know how like at the end of the day, kids are coming into the home being taken mm -hmm. back up. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine if moms were like, no, 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 you can't come home. You got to go back out and keep playing or you got to keep working. Um, so it is in that sense that they're not taken back up. So their effect would continue. Um, they, their, their effect would be exerted for a longer period of time. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, okay. There's so many questions up here, but let me <laughs> try to so, see. If we... so what does dopamine? Uh, I mentioned that serotonin is a neurotransmitter. Dopamine is also a neurotransmitter. Whereas serotonin has been connected to, um, serotonin deficiency has been connected to depression. Uh, dopamine can play a role in um, you know, depression as well. But dopamine helps you focus. Dopamine can play a very important role in um, focusing. And dopamine is also uh, plays a preeminent role in addiction. Um, so uh, substances that are addictive tend to increase dopamine at the level of a structure called the nucleus accumbens, um, uh, a very important uh, structure in the reward center of uh, the brain. Um, mm -hmm. So dopamine is a different neurotransmitter uh, than serotonin. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking the question: Is being in a depressive state a lack of positive coping uh, mechanism? Is being in a depressive state a lack of positive coping? So um, you'll want to know that the precise language is: um, to get a diagnosis of depression, you have to experience a depressive episode, mm -hmm. and a depressive episode requires, I believe, it's six out of, a, of, of four to six out of nine criteria that are very specific, which we talked about in the earlier um, programs. And so that's what's classed as a depressive episode. And you need a depressive episode and to, and to qualify um, for uh, uh, major de depression. So 
that's where the language can be a little confusing when you say uh, depressive state. Mm -hmm. um, so, so important to clarify that. But now let's try to unpack what we can. Is yeah. being in a depressive state a lack of positive coping and mechanism? So we were designed to be able to experience, for example, sadness. Mm -hmm. And because you're experiencing sadness, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you um, per se. And so in, in the psychiatric disorders, a lot of times what we're really talking about, what we listen to the word disorder. So we're talking about impairment of functioning. So that being in a depressive state does not necessarily mean you automatically have impaired ability to function. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the idea being, uh, let's see. So the idea just being that um, the, the fact that you got into a depressive state, it doesn't mean that you're not coping. It could mean you're just experiencing what took place. Mm -hmm. so, Example, there are significant, we've heard some bad news in the past few days. We heard that the interest rate went up considerably, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that put me in a depressed state. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking. But I certainly wasn't happy about it, that's for sure. Right. Um, and I don't think it's, um, I, I don't think it was poor coping. But after I, you know, was saddened by that, I also thought, okay, how do I, how do I increase my delivery of value? Um, mm -hmm. Um, how do I respond to this? Uh, and so, and so, yeah, it's important that we cope effectively, but I also think it's really important that we not dismiss our feelings mm -hmm. or, or pathologize them and say that, Hey, because I'm sad, that must mean there's something wrong with me. Right. Um, it would be a very normal response to a very abnormal situation. Right. Um, so I, I think that's important. What would you say about that? Well, you know, there's another question up here that I think, I mean, there's so many questions flying, but I want to try to address some. Um, this one is, how can you know if someone who hasn't voiced it is considering suicide? Um, and I guess how can, or basically, how can you know? And um, if they haven't voiced it, you're, it's, I mean, you can see that someone's like, you know, really sad and depressed and depression does not mean that someone is wanting to do self-harm or take their life. Um, but if someone, you know, says they have a plan and they have methods to do that, that is really the only way to know for sure. But if you have, if this is a person who's close to you, you definitely stay close to them. Um, you can encourage them to talk to a mental health professional. Um, but you know, just stay very close to them and have an empathetic listening ear for them and be there for them. Well said. Well said. Um, some some of the clues, and I'm not saying that okay. Well, you can go by this per se, but um, some of the clues that you you want to look for um, include uh, things like uh, people giving away things that is very important to them, and them saying, mm -hmm. you know, I want you to have this. I want yeah. I want you to keep this in in, in safe care. Um, uh, another clue is change in behavior. You know, you see a normal pattern, you see an everyday thing, and suddenly you see a change. Um, you can, you, all, all of the, the symptoms that we talked about um, for depression, you know, you can sometimes watch for those. You know, people uh, not being able to enjoy things they normally enjoy, um, people um, feeling sad, people feeling down, um, people not interested in the activity that they're normally um you know, interested in, or maybe they're speaking a lot less hopeful. Um, here is an important thing to understand about suicide, which makes it something very difficult to predict um, and in some ways even prevent. Mm -hmm. um, two key ingredients with suicide are number one, <coughs> excuse me, helplessness, and hopelessness. <laughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I mean, I coughed. It was contagious all the way across the country. <laughs> that's a powerful cough. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> okay. Yes. We that's want you to be. <clears throat> yes. Okay. 
if you're feeling better. Well, it must be a powerful point. It must be. We want to hear the point, too. So, yeah, there are two things that um, contribute to active suicidality. <clears throat> the first is hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is why purpose is such a big deal. But when a person feels like they've lost all hope, it can be a very dangerous place um, to be. But that's not necessarily um, all that it takes. Um, the other component is a feeling of desperation. So when you get that combination of both hopelessness and desperation, at least this is what I've seen in my clinical practice, mm -hmm. hopelessness and desperation, right. that's a very dangerous state to be in. And that's very instantaneous. That can be incredibly instantaneous which is why we have to be so careful about where we're placing our hope. Are we placing our hope in something that can be removed in an instant, leaving us feeling hopeless? So there are many people who their hope is in things and, and things that you would at first glance say, that's noble, that's a great thing to live for. The only problem is in a moment's notice, that thing could be taken away, and now they would be hopeless. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the responsibility is on us in building our hope in something that is lasting and not as vulnerable mm -hmm. to what I call the vicissitudes, that, that's vulnerable to the rapid changes um, in this life. And so you're wanting it in something that that's really lasting. Mm -hmm. um, for me, Personally, I'll tell you the hope that works for me. Because if I lived for my child, or if I lived for, let's say, my spouse, if that was the purpose for me, I could get a phone call that something happened to my child. Or I could get a, yeah. a phone call from my wife. My wife would say, I don't want to be with you anymore. Mm -hmm. And now I would totally lose all hope. Right. And if you combine that with desperation, I could be suddenly suicidal, per se. Mm -hmm. so I'm mm -hmm. saying, what works for me is the most powerful hope I've identified is, is the hope of, 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 of doing God's will in my life. Like doing, like what, what would you have me do, Lord? What, what is your mission for me? Mm -hmm. um, and so now, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I just, I just understand, oh, well, I guess this is God's new mission for me. Right. It's as if God is saying, look, um, um, uh, I want you to show them what I look like mm -hmm. in your situation. In your mm -hmm. situation, show what I look like. And then I understand the situations can change, but the mission remains the same. And right. so if the, the most horrible thing happened to me, if I, if I lost a loved one or what have you, I translate that as, I guess God wants me to show what, I, what he looks like in that situation. And for me, that's a lot less vulnerable to the ups and the downs of this life. Right, so, right. So, so that, that's a big deal. Yeah. We have another question. Um, is there a chance of getting off all this medicine or medication? Um, you know, that's only, well, I was just going to say that that's something that, you know, really only you and your, um, your doctor, your psychiatrist, um, your mental health professional, really your psychiatrist or medical doctor can work with you on. Um, but, you know, Dr. White, I'm, I'm sure you've seen patients where eventually they get off of medication. Um, well, yeah. And, and the, the, I mean, I'll be, you know, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible here. Um, so I remember, you know, I, I'll often work with patients where, hey, can I get it? I want to get off the meds. I want to get off the meds. I want to get off the meds. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I have always said, hey, why don't we prioritize function. Right. Why don't we prioritize um, function? Um, so I would say the goal is to work with your provider to really and truly optimize function. <clears throat> because heaven forbid, you get off the medications and you can't function. Right. You know? um, and the whole thing your healthcare provider hopefully should be doing is helping you optimize your function. I think the argument should be around functionality and your ability to experience um, 
uh, life. And so, again, you know, we're not your healthcare provider. It's a your your the conversation is between you and your healthcare provider. Right. Um, but this way, you don't you don't get into the trap of I get off the meds and my life falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, um, mm -hmm. Or I'm on the wrong meds and my life is falling apart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and then as we continue in the hits, you're going to see that there are um, there are things that you can do to activate wellness in your life. Right. What were you going to say? Well, something you said just triggered something that I wanted to just really um, encourage people who are working with a mental health professional, a psychiatrist, um, and they have you on medication, but you're not feeling better or you think things are you know, you're just not doing better to always the most important thing that I like to remind my clients is to communicate to the psychiatrist. Um, hey, this is making me feel this way, like always be in this open communication and dialogue because they have a huge toolbox um, that they can, you know, tinker with your medication to make it work for you. Like you're not supposed to be on medication and feel worse. Um, and so I just really encourage my clients to be open and communicate with their a psychiatrist or medical doctor. What what I've found with the psychiatrists that are truly talented, mm -hmm. um, uh, they are responsive. Yeah, and they have a wide array of tools to deal with the issues that come up. Those, to me, are are the um, the, the psychiatrists that are that are talented, um, mm -hmm. very responsive to yeah. their patients' right. uh, you know stated problem. And, and, and not only are they hearing it, but they're addressing it meaningfully to where they can move towards a solution. So mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely um, important. <clears throat> There's a question uh, that says, is it possible to press depression can suppress past um, events? I, I'm, it, I don't go ahead. I, the way it's worded makes me uh, want to answer it a certain uh, way, but go ahead. Well, that's a good question. Um, believe it or not, um, depression can actually mimic uh, dementia, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so the person can actually seem like you know you can, you can misdiagnose a person as demented um, when in fact they're depressed. And when you treat the depression, you start to see that their memory improve, and you know partly it's you've improved their motivation as well. Um, so. <clears throat> As you know, so so depression can reduce the motivation to think, you know, mm -hmm. and it can affect concentration and therefore memory as well. Um, uh, that's how I would answer that. But you know, I'm a little comfortable saying that it can suppress, you know, it can suppress, you know, past uh, memories. Um, I suppose it can make it a challenge to process because one of the things that depression can do is just it just can drain the emotional energy to where you don't really feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. Can you be depressed and not know it? Can you be depressed mm -hmm. and not know it? Well, um, there's denial, you know, denial can show up in a lot of psychiatric disorders. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the simple answer to that can be yes. Um, but there, like one of the ways that we talk about psychiatric disorders is in terms of, um, function you know so if you're functioning fine you're doing well at work your family's saying you're doing wonderfully and mm -hmm. you know you're happy go lucky and all of this other kind of stuff I, I wouldn't be worried about depression if you have objective outside measures saying that you're feeling fine you're doing fine and you have an internal you know you know internal uh, awareness saying i'm doing fine i don't see what the problem is um but the problem is if you're failing at work you're failing in your relationships. <clears throat> and, um, you know, again, you're meeting all of those syndromes. You know, you're, 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 you have a depressed mood. You're having trouble with sleep. You know, maybe you're exper experiencing weight gain, weight loss. You're having problems concentrating. You're having increased thoughts of death and dying. You know, you're, you're hitting off all of those, you know, markers. Um, yeah, you could be depressed without knowing it, uh, mm -hmm. per se. Um, you probably know there's a problem. You just don't know mm -hmm. what the problem is. And right. so when you get that official diagnosis. Um, so th that's, <clears throat> that's my answer to that question. <clears throat> 
Um, the toxic LD50 dosing medications. I have, you see the, the question that's um, on the screen right now. Should a patient always uh, get the toxic LD50 dosing for medications? That sure does sound I don't like the word toxic in that. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I, I, I don't like the word toxic. I, I'd have to um, review the definition of um, LD50. Yeah. I'll just have to not. But something about toxic and getting the toxic level, I have a problem <laughs> with that. But I have to review the definition of um, toxic LD50. Mm -hmm. um, goodness, there were there's lots of questions. And I think we only did one hit. Um, so maybe we'll go back to another hit. Um, uh, go ahead. So Did you want to it is um, developmental experiences. Yeah. So Develop. there are developmental um, experiences that can increase the risk of depression. Again, this is according to Dr. Nedley's um, um, 10 hits. So when we're talking about developmental issues, you know, we're talking about um, sometimes it might be abuse, whether physical, verbal, sexual, mm -hmm. you know, that a person may have experienced in life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these are experiences that can mm -hmm. negatively impact mental um, wholeness and wellness. Mm -hmm. And you can see there, this is the reason why we as parents are, are fierce in our protection of the experience of our children. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know doing everything possible to keep them safe. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we understand that, you know, some of these negative experiences in childhood can, you know, profoundly impact uh, mm -hmm. subsequent uh, conditions. But again, it's just one hit. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and these would be considered childhood traumas, right? It could be considered childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's not just traumas in childhood. You know, there right. are traumas, emotional, physical, and otherwise, that can occur, you know, all throughout life. Yes. And they yes. can predispose you to mental health, you know, mm -hmm. conditions and disorders. And would you say, um, you know, childhood traumas, you know, experiences, um, this hit, developmental hit, and would it, if there is a childhood trauma, would you say it's an unresolved or untreated childhood trauma in childhood that would cause us to be a hit for depression um, when you become an adult? <clears throat> Um, I would lean towards untreated. I would mm -hmm. definitely lean towards um, untreated. If you can get treatment, obviously that would help because part right. of treatment is going to help you um, be mentally well. It's going to help you mm -hmm. heal. That's, that's the whole goal. Mm -hmm. But the idea just being it, it is a hit. Is a hit, but yeah, that by, by definition, if you get treatment, it, it, it pushes you towards healing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that certainly, if you don't get treatment, it probably increases the likelihood that it would have a negative, you know, impact um, on healing and wellness. And so, you know, you get traumas that can uh, increase the likelihood of numerous psychiatric, you know, disorders, like mm -hmm. you literally have whether it's <clears throat> post-traumatic stress disorder right. or we talk about borderline personality disorder or depression or anxiety or a host of you know conditions can actually result from a, a history of trauma mm -hmm. how does depression affect development it's a good question how does depression okay. uh, like if a child is if a child is um depressed um can that impact um in their current developmental stage Depression has been documented to have a profound impact, not only on mental well-being, mm -hmm. um, but not only on mental well-being, but even on physical, even on physical. Like there, there have been some studies, you know, linking um, depression to other, you know, chronic diseases, whether diabetes, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. so not only can, you know, depression impact you from a mental standpoint it can actually impact you from a physical standpoint right uh, so it, it can be profound <clears throat> mm -hmm. someone said can we hear all 10 tonight i can tell you that we're not going to get to all 10 tonight um which is okay because that's why we are at mental health monday so um because of time i know that we're not but we're gonna get through a few more at least 
uh, one sure. more uh, possibly, but um, we're definitely think- going to get to all 10 by hopefully the end of next week. Go ahead. A big one is addictions. Yeah. A profound one is addictions. And so mm-hmm. <clears throat> how how can addictions um, impact, you know, your mental well-being? Uh, so you'll recall earlier that I mentioned, my goodness, man, this, some diagrams would be really cool. And so, you know, we'll look at that. We'll look at the possibilities. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll look at the possibilities of that. Okay, so whatever the case, I mentioned that this was the presynaptic neuron and it has the power to imagine just releasing. Let's use the canvas of our thinking, the canvas of our imagination. I want you to see little balls. Well, I want you to see, um, I want you to see a protein that is coming out and is going to interact with receptors. Mm -hmm. And we said that there's like that that protein can then go back up into this um, neuron through transporters. But then I mentioned that, you know, the that, that these antidepressants can block the transporter so that that the neurotransmitter can't get home. It can't get back into the um, into the neuron. And so right. now it's got to continue to play. It's got to continue doing what it's doing, interacting with that receptor. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not just antidepressants that do that. It's not just, you know, those antidepressant drugs. Believe it or not, cocaine, mm-hmm. for example, is a, is a drug. It's a, it's a chemical that will block the reuptake of dopamine. Um, right. And not just cocaine, believe it or not, methamphetamines, for example, will block the reuptake of, 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 of dopamine. Mm-hmm. Not just that methamphetamines will actually <laughs> increase the release of dopamine. So why am I telling you this? Because we're talking about how it is that addictions can actually increase the likelihood of depression. depression. Well, guess what these drugs can ultimately do? So let's take, for example, um, you know, methamphetamines. Methamphetamines can pr- uh, promote the emptying of that neuron of its dopamine, okay? So mm-hmm. the dopamine stores can go down. The other thing is that dopamine can impact the it can it can impact the neuro the um uh, the receptors to the point where you can get down regulation of those receptors okay mm-hmm. so now the person's going to have trouble enjoying themselves um, mm-hmm. because you're going to need even more dopamine so that they can actually experience joy mm-hmm. i'm just giving you some concrete examples on how getting addicted to a substance and you know continued exposure to that substance can actually cause changes in those two neurons to the point where you're increasing the likelihood of conditions like, for example, depression, okay? So that was, that was one example. You have alcohol, for example, which we know is a depressant, okay? So that also increases the likelihood of depression because it is a depressant. But then the other thing is once a person becomes habituated to alcohol, in the absence of alcohol, they become more anxious. Okay, so yeah, there are quite a number of ways in which um, addiction um, can promote, whether it's the development of depression or anxiety or other Mm -hmm. disorders. Mm -hmm. I just want to say this, the brain really is resilient because we only went through three hits so far, genetic, developmental, and now addiction. And even with those three, the, the brain is so resilient that you could have experienced all three of those and still not be clinically uh, depressed, according to uh, Dr. Ned Lee's 10 um, hit. Um, but let, I mean, but let, let's qualify, let, 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 let me just qualify that. Okay. For example, one hit could be addiction and, and that could not, that could be enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, as, as much as that's, as much as that said, I think he's just articulating what he's observed. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, you could see how just an addiction is enough to really, you know, um, mm-hmm. to, to, to really impact things. Yeah. But what's interesting, though, in, in fairness to what he's saying, it's going to be tough to get a person who's addicted to a substance who's not going to also have disruption in some of these other hits. Right. Right. So that, that's what will make it kind of, you know. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. If you have addiction, um, if you're, yeah, if you have addiction, 
more than likely these other hits are you you're going to have some of these other hits and more than four. Right, right. <clears throat> There's, um, um, oh, go ahead. No, I'll, I'll you, sir. No, there was another good question that's up on the screen right now. Um, which part of the brain stores the childhood traumas um, if the memory, and then if the memory can just block it out without becoming depressed or having depression, is that even wise to do? Um, um, okay, okay. So I'm not thinking that a winning strategy is trying to just block out the memory. Yeah, I'm never. not thinking that that's a winning strategy. And then number two, with regard to what's the structure that is important in memory, that's how I'm gonna reinterpret that question. So um, the hippocampus plays a very important role in, in memory, especially memory formation. Where are memories stored? Um, my sense is memories are stored throughout the brain, but that's a, I am gonna jot that question down and do a little research, you know, um, and, and come back, come back next, next week. And we'll talk about where our memory is stored. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that um, the hippocampus plays a really important role right. in, um, in formation and my senses to some degree um, in memory storage as well. But let me come back to you on that. Mm -hmm. When I don't know something, I will acknowledge I'm not too sure about that one. Um, but yeah, great question. Um, yeah. There was a question that was up there that was like, um, if a if a mother is depressed and the, right. if she's pregnant, um, how does that affect uh, the fetus, her her baby? What a fantastic question. What a fantastic mm -hmm. question. So the problem is when when you're depressed, especially with the body, things are not like just isolated to this one area. So depression is going to affect a number of the other hormones. Um, so we, we know, for example, that when people are anxious and then they're in a chronically anxious state, that can impact the by cortisol. The problem is it's not going to just be isolated to the mother's experience. Her physical state is going to actually impact the fetus as well. Right. Um, so, so there can be an impact. I mean, by the, by the time I, you know, studied um, the, the impact that mom can have on baby, uh, the bottom line was I wanted to be as wonderful as possible to my wife, especially during pregnancy, especially mm -hmm. during pregnancy. Um, if, you're, if your spouse, significant other, sister, mother, whoever is pregnant, um, it's not that you shouldn't be wonderful all the time. You really should be, mm -hmm. but you really want them in the happiest state possible a peaceful state a restful state a state where they feel calm and secure because that's going to affect their their hormonal ecosystem nice word for like everything that's going on inside you know um it's going to more positively impact um that fetus that they're building and so you you've seen all you've seen the commercials you've seen the movies where you know mom wants um Peanut butter and ice cream, you run out and get the peanut butter and ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, your goal being, you really want that person happy. You want them at peace. You do not want to be stressing the person out and giving them this miserable experience. Um, you know, it, it's just pretty, it's pretty logical that you're happier with the, with, with the product um, accordingly. Anyway, that, that's my two cents on that issue. Yes, definitely mom's. Um, depression can affect uh, the baby. I'm trying to get some of these other questions before we have to actually end, um, but I think we... Um... I love the suggestion of uh, wonder of the worlds for my cough. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, I forgot who that was. That was uh, Joanne Stephen. Thank you very much. Wonder of the world leaves are very good for coughs. Thank you. That's never happened to me on camera in my life. So that, that was the first. <laughs> Okay. How does depression affect development? If not, all that, where to get the information? Um, so the book is um, Depression the Way Out. Um, mm -hmm. Depression the Way Out by um, Neil Nedley. That's where you can find the um, find, um, all 10. Anhedonia plays a major role. Anhedonia is mm -hmm. when you do not enjoy the things that you normally enjoy. Uh, let's see. Good sermon, my pastor. I'm looking at a, a, a somebody stating something, but I think the first part was 
earlier. Um, this is Joanne Stephen. Um, yeah. Okay. Look, this is this is what we're gonna take as the last question. Let's let's find a good one for the last one. Yes. Um, someone said, Pastor Meyer said, this is Gregory Hall. Pastor Meyer said we could use the articles in the sanctuary to deal with anger, weight loss, and depression. How could I help someone that doesn't know these articles get help, get the help that they, um, need? Um, so I think, I, I, I think that that question is really important because I really admire Pastor Myers is, you know, commit to infuse his sermons with practical, actionable things. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one of his sermons in particular where he cited so many, um, he cited so many research articles, you know, because he is so passionate about, you know, infusing science into what it is that he's saying. And so um, on Saturdays, you know, don't don't miss the opportunity to come and hear um, how he makes sure to keep his word relevant. So please don't miss that. Mm -hmm. um, that happens on Saturdays. Um, you know, you'll see Sister Tante right there next to him. You know, providing mm -hmm. support as well. So don't don't miss that. Um, and the other thing we would encourage is please don't forget to give to the Living Man of Ministry um, because. Yes. It's what it's what makes these kind of programs possible, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I can't tell you how much Living Manor wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so proud of the other days, Atante. I'm so inspired to up level my game as much as possible. You know? <laughs> yeah, so, I know because Dr. Schweltz and Dr. Reynolds come uh, on tomorrow, they and they'll be talking about physical health, and definitely, oh it's incredible. I yeah. loved his presentation because I was ready to go out the very next day and start making some changes. So we want to do oh, the yeah. same as well. And, and that's why we don't want to rush through these 10 hits, you know, because we could just right. run through them all. Um, right. But we want to have a meaningful discussion on each one so mm -hmm. that you really get a sense of, hey, what can I do to avoid uh, succumbing to depression as a result? But that, um, but with regard to the sanctuary, um, the, the best way to, to help a person would have been, let's say now, for example, you're trained in right. the field of mental health, and now you're going to provide support to that person. Um, and a lot of us, we don't have that training so that the best thing we can do is encourage that person to get themselves in the hands of professionals. Why? Because we're dealing with life and death here. We, we are dealing with a condition where a person can say to you, everything is okay, and then go and harm themselves, mm -hmm. okay? We are dealing with a condition where I can be laughing outwardly while I'm dying inwardly. That's and right. I don't have to communicate to you, and you don't necessarily have the skills to understand that that's what's happening. And, and this is the reason why it is, it's sometimes dangerous for us to put ourselves in the place of mental health professionals. Right. Who, by the way, they're limited in what they can do, but at least they have some measure of proficiency. This mm -hmm. is not a situation where you win all the time, mm -hmm. but it sure would help if you have some of the basic fundamental skills. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So as, as far as using the sanctuary, it, it would help if you had the if you had the actual skill sets to understand how those sanctuary principles might translate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's the caution that I would want to add to that question. Yeah. And I would like, and I would, you know, just to, to add on to that, always encourage people to, to talk to a mental health professional if, if they're, you know, dealing with depression or anxiety or any mental health issue. And then something like that study of the sanctuary is very powerful. And there's some very life giving um, steps within those six articles of furniture that can be life changing in so many different ways. Um, and so that could be supplemental to what you're doing. Um, but definitely, 
Um, if there's, if depression is, if you feel like you're depressed or someone, you know, is depressed, always the best thing is to connect them to a mental health professional. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the, the sanctuary biblical things are always, um, just a great thing to go along with that as well. Thank you so much for that, Janelle. We are going to have to jump off at this, um, point. Um, but again, you can see it just goes so, um, fast um it does so our hour goes by fast we only got through three of the hits there's seven more and we're going to pick that up next week so we'll be right here same time on the same um social media platform that you're watching right now um we have to say good night and goodbye but uh make sure you tune in next week and share this link um just to re-watch for yourself and share with um a friend or a loved one I just want to end uh, with prayer um, and just thanking you all for watching. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this opportunity uh, to uh, just provide uh, mental health information and resources every Monday. Lord, I pray for every viewer that is watching live now, every viewer that will watch after uh, the broadcast has ended. Uh, please give them guidance um, with their depression and any other mental health issue they're going through. Lord, bring a mental health professional into their life after they seek someone out that will be beneficial and help them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good night.